All right. Well, I think we can get started and other folks might drift in. So my name is Gabe Keller Flores. I know many of you. I'm the office manager at Common Ground and one of our teachers and filling in for Shelly tonight. So looking forward to, to being together. So why don't we settle in for some meditation time? So just doing what you can to relax and come into your body. Tuning in to how the body feels tonight. Encouraging a relaxation. We can think of it as a coming home, coming home to the body. right here and now. And the body includes the experience of hearing, the experience of temperature on the skin, pressure where the Body is making contact with the cushion or the chair. So, whatever aspect of embodiment is predominant, you can just let that register as a reminder that we're here and now embodied sensitive contact happening at the senses every moment. We're just tuning into that, being sensitive to that. Letting that in, letting in the reality of embodiment. And the encouragement is to cultivate a continuity, a continuity of mindful awareness. And it may be that there is some aspect of the present moment experience, some aspect of embodiment 
whether that's hearing, the experience of hearing, the experience of feeling the body upright and sitting, relaxing into the sitting posture, feeling the support from the earth, or feeling the rhythm, the rhythm of breathing. It may be that one of these experiences is comfortable and familiar. And the mind can rest. Tuning into that aspect of the present moment experience in a moment to moment way. Noticing the changing nature of whatever the experience is. So I'll encourage us to see if there is a aspect of embodiment. I suggested are offered the experience of hearing or full body, whole body awareness or the sensations of breathing in and breathing out. And there may be other, another aspect of experience that you're familiar and is comfortable for you. But if if not, maybe pick one of those three, one that feels comfortable, even pleasant, and see what it's like to just give the attention in a relaxed way to being present for this changing experience. Not in a tight way, not in a focused way even, but just keeping it in mind. Sharon Salzberg gives the image of if we're in a crowd of people and our friend is a little ways away, we just keep them in mind. We know, oh, they're just a little ways away. They're just over there. So it's relaxed. We don't need to rush over, push everyone else out of the way. But we're just keeping in mind, oh, yeah. Breathing is happening, the whole body awareness is, is happening, is present, or the field of hearing is present, is happening. And this can be a way for the mind to rest and put down its neurotic habits of planning and worrying and thinking about things we don't need to think about. Remembering it's okay to relax. Instead of rushing out, trying to find the experience, maybe it's possible to relax, settle back, and let whatever the experience is we're noticing, let it come to us in a way. Practicing maybe a more receptive awareness, even as we're tuning in to a particular aspect of the present moment. But we don't need to control it. We're actually just receiving, noticing, attending to
So let's continue in silence, remembering that it's helpful to relax. And finding some aspect of present moment experience to incline the mind towards as a way of simplifying our experience and developing moment to moment mindful awareness. Just doing the best we can and letting that be good enough.
So let's take a minute and stretch, get a drink of water if you need to. Nice to see you all. So if you weren't here earlier, uh, my name is Gabe Keller Flores and I'm the office manager at Common Ground and one of our teachers and filling in for Shelly tonight. Really happy to, to have this time together to reflect a little bit on the topic of Metta. And uh, I'll, I'll share some thoughts and then hopefully we'll have some time to, to talk together. So, hopefully metta is, is a theme that we're all, you know, attuned to in one way or another. Um, as I've been reflecting on on this topic, it occurred to me that I don't really think we would we would really survive without metta in one way or the other, whether it's towards ourself, giving ourselves a break when we're having a hard time or or receiving it from others or just, you know, the um, the generosity of what we receive, how we can tune into um, a kind of metta or just a, a benevolence or a, a, the gift of nature, what we, what we receive. And one way or the other, just that uh, tuning into that feeling of friendliness, that there's, that the universe, at least in some pockets of it in our own heart and in those around us that there's there's friendliness available uh, goodwill available harmony and uh yeah this is really i think what keeps us going what keeps us feeling nourished and sadly um it's not a given it's it's a uh, our our human hearts um even though sometimes people will say that we you know that the human heart is inherently good but the buddha didn't say that <laughs> he said that human hearts the human beings our capacity for good and bad is as very as variegated as there are living beings. You know, our hearts are capable of a lot of beauty, patience and strength and energy and all the beautiful qualities. And they're capable of hard-heartedness and greed and selfishness. And we all know this. Um, and so this makes it really relevant that uh, this is why the Buddha taught, taught that this is a, these are practices that we can develop, that the mind is, is conditioned and uh, is conditioned by many, many forces. And one of those is um, whatever the mind frequently dwells upon. So the, the intentions in the mind. So this, um, this quality of metta in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is really the Buddha's whole path to freedom. Um, the metta falls under the second factor, which is um, right intention. And there's three kinds of right intention, metta or goodwill, 
compassion and renunciation or generosity. So this, um, this quality is definitely something that we can cultivate. It's definitely something that we're all, I'm sure, familiar with and we've all um, felt from others, goodwill, and we've all seen in our own hearts. So even though, <laughs> you know, maybe our hearts are capable of both wholesome and unwholesome, but they're, they're capable of wholesome. And that's, you know, so we can reflect on the goodness of this heart, the goodness that we've cultivated, the seeds of goodness that are in this heart that have some momentum, however strong or weak, you know, that may be, but but it is possible to cultivate the wholesome and to incline the mind in that direction and for that to, um, to grow and strengthen until it becomes more of a habit of mind. Um, and this is, this is good news <laughs> that our hearts and minds are malleable in that way. Um, it also works the other way, of course, which is, you know, why, for instance, with this teaching on metta, the Buddha really uh, explicitly encouraged us to practice it all day long so that, you know, this attitude of, of uh, kindness, friendliness, goodwill, like we, need, we have an attitude <laughs> all day long, one way or the other. So the encouragement is this attitude of goodwill is really beneficial and really supports us and protects us. And in this translation is goodwill is really applicable in all situations and towards all beings. And that's what the Buddha, again, explicitly encouraged. And you'll hear that if you've heard some of the chants about metta, you know, in all directions, in every way to all beings, short or tall. So there's this sense that, uh, that this is an attitude that is really functional, that can really be applied in all situations and with all beings. And that it's, it liberates our heart from all the ways that um, we tend to fall into aversion and irritation and hatred and greediness and preferencing and um, craving all the ways that um, that we relate to other beings and to ourselves trying to protect ourselves trying to be safe trying to control but you know in um, in acting from greed and aversion, even though we're trying to take care of ourselves, um, but but when we act with greed and aversion, we're actually creating more insecurity. Um, there's a poem from the suttas that speaks to this, and that's a, a bit of the theme I wanted to speak to tonight was metta as a protection. So you know, we're on one level we feel vulnerable. We're in a vulnerable world. You know, there are, are dangers, there's insecurity, and we want to protect ourselves. And often the way we try to do that is through controlling things, getting what we want, getting rid of what we don't want. But in doing that, in acting out that fear and aversion and greed, we can create the very habits of mind of being tight, of being tense, of being controlling that actually um, make our mind a less... Um, a less flexible and nimble instrument for navigating life. So this is a poem from, um, I believe it's from the Atta Vaga, which is called The Book of Eights, um, which is uh, apparently one of the oldest uh, collections of discourses, of, of verses attributed to the Buddha. And this is just a section from one of them. Fear is born from arming oneself. Just see how many people fight. 
I'll tell you about the dreadful fear that caused me to shake all over. Seen creatures flopping around like fish in water too shallow, so hostile to one another. Seeing this, I became afraid. This world completely lacks essence. It trembles in all directions. I longed to find myself a place unscathed, but I could not see it. Seeing people locked in conflict, I became completely distraught. But then I discerned here a thorn, hard to see, lodged deep in the heart. It's only when pierced by this thorn that one runs in all directions. So if that thorn is taken out, one does not run and settles down. So that thorn in the heart, we could think of that as this basic tendency to think that if, I, if only I could get the conditions just right, then I would be at ease. And not seeing that um, in that whole orientation, there is already stress. Um, and that's not to say, of course, that we don't do our best to have comfortable conditions and set in motion um, situations that are supportive for our well-being and, and for that of, of others. Obviously, we do. But especially when, you know, in this poem, you see when, when things are hard, when there is um, conflict, that tendency to perpetuate that out of fear and aversion to get tight and then to justify aversion, justify selfishness or whatever it might be. And that that, like the poem says, that actually creates more insecurity, the constant need for security, whether that's psychological security, needing you to see me the way I want you to see me, um, that that's a limited, a limited strategy for happiness because conditions as we've all experienced, are impermanent and unreliable. And so, given this situation, um, the question is what, what attitude and what intentions in the mind really do support protection, really do support a sense of safety that is less, uh, less fragile. And that's one way we can think about metta is that primarily goodwill, this cultivation of goodwill, while obviously it has benefits for others, we're more pleasant to be around and we can, our, our intention is to support others and, um, and that is a gift to others. But primarily we are creating a, a refuge of, of protection for our own heart. We're protecting our own hearts from our tendencies to fall into aversion and ill will and hatred and fear, which we know is a source of suffering for ourselves and leads to suffering for others and leads to conflict and disharmony. And there's so many teachings in the, in the discourses where the Buddha really made this point quite clearly and strongly um, that this attitude of goodwill is really supportive for us and, uh, and protects us from the danger of ill will. And I, I just appreciate that, um, that framing and that basic point 
that it's that there is uh it's like to me it it has the feeling of really valuing this heart and valuing um yeah the heart and mind that we live with that we live in and that it really matters what that state of that heart and mind is for ourselves and for others um it's like it's like we know both sides we know that this heart is capable of really beautiful openness and generosity and kindness and goodwill and patience and wisdom it's like we know that there is a jewel here we know that there is the possibility for freedom for more you know more capacity than sometimes we we imagine the possibility of letting go letting go of resentment of forgiveness so we know that that's possible and we know from our own direct experience the freedom that's there the freedom from ill will and hostility and how refreshing that is how liberating that is and we know the suffering of being caught in anger of being caught in resentment and hatred and fear and because and 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 of course the suffering that that comes can come from that you know the um the pain when we the remorse when we act out of aversion and cause suffering to others even when we don't intend to but just that 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 we're sort of <laughs> we're walking around with this this intention factory that's always always acting in a way you know always producing karma and so in a way it's like the buddha is really telling us this you know there's not really a neutral in a way you know either our heart is relating in a way that's more expansive less contracted more open more generous more um you know more forgiving and and kind or there's it's kind of leaning in the other direction and that this is a this is something we can be tuned into all the time and that it matters it um And I think this this understanding that it's this quality is um, is protecting us from ourselves first and foremost, and protecting others from ourselves. I think that for me, at least, it's sort of a helpful understanding of what the Buddha, why the Buddha taught metta, um, because I think we can we have all sorts of ideas about. Um, words like love and loving kindness there's so many associations and we have i'm i'm guessing just a lot of because it's uh they're common words and we've we all use them and we have our own understandings of them and their ideals and and we we read about people who really have these qualities strongly developed or or seem to And we can use I beautiful ideals like universal boundless love. We can use that idea to feel bad about ourselves, <laughs> which, you know, is is not the point. And and I think this understanding that metta is a liberation of the heart from our tendency towards ill will. That for me is really accessible and um, and that it's in it's more in my understanding it's more about the breadth of application than about the intensity or the juiciness of you know some more rarefied state which that's beautiful 
you know, and we, we have those experiences and, you know, I mean, romantic love is sort of probably on the end of that spectrum or one of the most intense experiences we can have where it's just all we see are the beautiful qualities of somebody at, at some stage. And, uh, and it's, it's very pleasant and, and there's a lot of affection there. And then, but then maybe something changes and we've probably all experienced how quickly that can shift because it's, uh, we're kind of dependent on that juice and um, particular conditions and somebody, basically it's, it's affection and um, liking, you know, liking some, some, someone and, and so this is, metta is something that can be applied to, to all beings. And so goodwill, as I've been studying, seems to be maybe goodwill or friendliness, maybe the most close translations to what the Buddha was suggesting as a universal attitude. Because goodwill is something we can feel even towards people maybe we don't particularly like. But can't we at least imagine, even towards people we don't like, wishing for them to be happy? Even people who are causing suffering, we can wish that they understand the causes for happiness, the, the real causes for happiness, and that they act in skillful ways. Um, and so, so that's the idea is that this is something that we can, that we can apply, yeah, in all situations and, and towards all beings. And that it's really about this heart and all the ways that it tends to get caught in aversion and tends to justify aversion in one way or the other. Like, yeah, may all beings be happy except that person or you know, accept me, I don't deserve it. But this is, we're seeing, you know, when we, when we see those places where we're justifying aversion, then what we're um, practicing tuning into is that that, that that suffering, that that hold, pushing someone out of our hearts, pushing ourselves out of our hearts is a contracted state. And looking at the ways we justify it and asking, is it, is it ever helpful, actually? It may be totally justified. It's not to say that it's wrong. It's a normal human emotion. That's why we have words for hatred and ill will. But is, is it ever helpful? And again, it's not, you know, we don't want to deny these emotions or repress them. I think actually... Um, this cultivation, especially when we're focused on the breadth of goodwill, like that, that even just that idea, what would it be like if the Buddha is suggesting cultivating goodwill in all directions to all beings, then we're going to see all the places where we don't think that that's reasonable. And then we, we work with it and, um, and we feel our irritation, we feel our hatred, we see it. And we, and we see what it feels like and we sort of, yeah, question and experiment. And this is where I think goodwill as a translation, as opposed even to loving kindness, which is the most common translation, can be helpful in, in sort of these sticky, stickier places where we may not feel love for someone or not even feel affection or liking them. But does that mean we want them to suffer forever? Because that's sort of the opposite of goodwill. And what would it be like? And goodwill, again, doesn't, it, you know, it's sort of goodwill. It's sort of, <laughs> it's kind of a low bar in a sense, but it's still the, the real benefit there, again, is that our hearts are free of aversion and ill will. We're not stuck in that hatred. And so... Goodwill can coexist with, it doesn't 
it doesn't have to be even affectionate or that, you know, that we, we need to like someone even, but what is that sense? And we've probably all had this experience at different times in our life with people that, you know, for one reason or another, we haven't been able to be, um, or we haven't wanted to be, we haven't, you know, people who have harmed us. We don't want to be in close contact with them. We don't feel a lot of affection for them. And yet, maybe at times it's possible, oh yeah, well, may they be well, may they find their way. And this, and we, we've probably all seen, you know, I think this is sort of the turning point in terms of forgiveness when someone has harmed us and we, you know, whatever that process has been, uh, where there's a point where we, we understand harm was caused, someone acted unskillfully, but we see that the resentment is just hurting us. And, um, you know, whether we say, I forgive you or not, or call it that or not, but there's sort of a turning that, oh, maybe, maybe I don't need to be holding so tightly to this, um, to this resentment. Maybe I can open a little to the truth that they're a suffering human being that also wants to be happy. Again, you know, doesn't mean that we even have any contact with them. But it's our own heart that we're attending to there. Oh, this is a burden on my heart. And I don't, this is so painful, this hatred, this. And so this is really the primary aim is the, uh, the liberation of the heart, of this heart from ill will and hostility. But it's an exploration and it, and it includes it has to include being honest and real about the ill will and hostility and all the little irritations and annoyances and the despair and the grief and the fear. But I think sort of the, the, the beauty of this teaching is that this is a, a this is a functional sort of orientation and attitude that can really be at the center of all of our relating to others and to ourselves, like goodwill towards ourselves, all the parts of ourselves, even the parts of ourselves we don't like, towards others, imperfect, towards the world, so imperfect. But that this, uh, this goodwill, it's, it's really what allows for all the other beautiful kinds of connection and um, intentions. It's just that basic orientation of caring, of being sensitive to how hard it is to be a human being. And instead of aiming for perfection, being too attached to ideals of how things should be, how I should be, goodwill, it's just goodwill. It's just, it's that, it's that sense that, that hopefully we've all gotten at one point or the other, you know, unconditional positive regard. I've been noticing this, um, especially these days with the pandemic, uh, like all of us, I'm sure just not, not seeing as many people. And then, but when I do go out, you know, to the grocery store or whatever, I often can sense, yeah, just the sense of metta, just it's nice to see people. <laughs> and it's like, it's not about who they are, meeting some idea or anything, but, you know, we sort of have this affinity when there isn't something else in the way. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't wish for you to suffer. Yeah, if it was up to me, yeah, please be happy. You know, there's just, so it's, it's pretty, um, it's not really complicated. And yet, in some ways, that's what makes it hard because it is so simple.
And we notice even in those little moments, you know, whether it's like the example I gave or other places in our lives where it's just really obvious, you know, with a pet or, you know, a, a child in our life that's really easy. It's just like, you know, we just are reminded, oh, yeah, this feels really good this goodwill, this kindness, this friendliness, and that this heart right here is capable of that. And, you know, it might be in those more simple scenarios. It might also be we notice just this capacity and appreciate it and appreciate it in the more complicated places in our life where we are seeing just a lot of our capacity for aversion and, and ill will, and it even feels justified, you know, rationally. But when we are sensitive, we see, oh, this is really painful and doesn't really help and is sort of essentializing this person as completely bad, which isn't really true. And we and, and sort of finding in those places because we're we're tuned into to wanting to this heart to be a sublime abiding, a beautiful place for ourselves to reside and and just curious about well what would that look like in this situation and in, in the more challenging places. And maybe finding that there is capacity, you know, finding it's an, it's an exploration and it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it has to be fresh. It's, it's not something we impose, you know, oh, this is what kindness looks like. And then we just try to look like that, pretend that, oh, no, I don't, you know, I'm not bothered. You know, it's totally fine, whatever, you know. But actually... You know, what is it like when we are irritated and yet uh, we don't want to act that out because we care, because there's goodwill. And it's I think it's actually in those moments, in those places where there's some, some rub, some fire, some heat, some friction, where we actually learn, and I think what we're learning is how much we value our own heart and our own our own hearts, um, the state of our heart. Like uh, I think there's teachings in the suttas about um, just kind of what aversion does to you, and um, yeah, I'm not remembering the specific if this is right or not, but there's some somewhere in the sutta, there's something about like realizing you're wearing a garland of rotting flesh, which is a, an intense image, but it's like, oh, yeah, this doesn't, this is not what I'm trying to cultivate. This is not, this, in some ways we're, um, I mean, yeah, I've noticed in the last week or so, I was just more irritable and, and yeah, just kind of being mean in ways that I, I, didn't feel good and you know I apologized and I really said to this person yeah I'm gonna I'm really gonna try because and it's sort of that sense yeah that that's not that's not it's not what I want to set in motion and it's and it's the, that sort of recognition and seeing oh this is this is just painful the world is already so painful we, life is already so hard you know, why would I want to be adding more? And uh, and I think it's from the, you know, just little moments like that, little recognitions where we're seen. And it can be hard to see that about ourselves. It's not something any of us would want to admit. But if it's, if it's there, it's feeling that pain and seeing it that motivates us. Well, is that, does it have to be that way? And what would not in a fake way or in a forced way, but what what would goodwill actually look like in this situation? What and you know, goodwill is just one word, and it's really it's not about the word, obviously, but like what is it what's happening in the situation where I feel like I can't be open in some ways I, I feel like it's just being open to another person's humanity and kind of letting it in. I feel like as long as one way or the other, that sort of registering as opposed to, oh, this person is just a means to an end or just someone I need to deal with to get on with my day. But just that sort of like, I'm going to just let in that you're here, I'm sensitive to you, you're a human being like me. And just not that we think all those words, but there's just that resonance. 
that 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 seems to be the basis for this kind of just empathy um, and sensitivity that then unless yeah unless the mind is distracted or caught up there's just I find usually a natural wish yeah I don't want this person to suffer if there's anything I can do in this interaction that would um, you know convey that I I see this person and that um, that I have goodwill towards them or at least I don't have ill will don't have aversion don't have fear just yeah, you exist. You deserve happiness just like I do. We're sharing space for however long. May this be a pleasant, harmonious sharing, however they, that may be. And I think that's really important too, that that we're not tied to some idea of how um, metta has to look. A, a lot of what I'm sharing um has been prompted by, I read a book recently by Tanisra Bhikkhu called The Sublime Abidings. Uh, and he's really um, looking at how the Buddha talked about metta and sort of clarifying because we may have all sorts of ideas about love that may not be exactly what the Buddha was talking about. And just our own assumptions and cultural conditioning and um, and one of his, he, he has this list of misperceptions that he's going through and clarifying. And one of them is that metta is best expressed as acts of uncritical tenderness. And that that may be a, an assumption we have. Oh yeah, metta, it's about, yeah, just uh, uncritical tenderness. And certainly that is one way that it can be expressed in a really beautiful way and that may be really appropriate and healing in a given situation. But one point uh, that he makes a lot that I really appreciate is that metta is really, in the definition of goodwill, it's really the wish for happiness for others. Um, and so it's it can be expressed in any number of ways. It's just what's appropriate in the situation because, and if we're too attached to what it looks like, and if, you know, to be honest, sometimes probably because kindness and love are also ideals in our society that we judge ourselves and others by, so we we want to be seen uh, a lot of the time as loving and kind people because it's it's a good thing. Um, but if we're too attached to what you know what we're looking like, then it can even happen that because we have this idea, this is what uh, kindness looks like, but it's actually not what would be supportive. It's not maybe, it's not what the other person would make them happy in a given situation. I mean, one classic example of this from the suttas is, um, there's a story of a monk who was bitten by a snake and died, and the other monks go to the Buddha, and the Buddha instructs them to uh, direct metta towards the snakes and there's these verses wishing well to the, the, the four different snake kingdoms and at the end it says yeah, may the be may the snakes be well may they depart and so because it's actually in everyone's best interest in that situation for the snakes and the monks the monastics to not live together because that's what will support their happiness. And so, um, you know, and there's other examples of the Buddha speaking quite sternly and maybe even we could call it anger. Although it depends how you define anger if the Buddha is someone without ill will. But, you know, what is anger without ill will? You know, or, you know, we could just call it this strong, force of protection, of wishing well, you know, when the Buddha would admonish monastics who behaved unskillfully, he would say things like, foolish person, this is not for your well-being, this is not for, so there's, so maybe metta and anger don't necessarily, uh, maybe they can coexist. And all sorts of different ways, you know, that that this metta, this wish for happiness can express itself. 
through humor, um, you know, just through a more, um, just through being, you know, just through presence, not through maybe always, yeah, maybe that isn't always so obvious even, because it's not about what it looks like. It's about the heart being free of aversion and hostility and, and wishing well, and that, that feeling and that intention. And then if we're in touch with that intention, then we're actually interested in what are the causes for happiness here in the situation. And we'll, we'll be sensitive to that in the particular situation and responding from that. And I think this, um, going back maybe to the idea of the, the breadth of application is really what what is mo most important because that's where we'll purify. That's where we'll see all the places, like I've been saying, where we do justify aversion. And the point is to see that um, and to see what that feels like and the effects that it has, that it leads to suffering for ourselves and others. And to be, yeah, to really be protective of this metta as a protection for ourselves. And I think in that, just again, like, um, being open to that possibility that, you know, just in, in whatever moment in the day, what would goodwill what would kindness look like here? And I think this encouragement from the Buddha with this really, in a way, really high standard of, you know, in all directions, to all beings, in every way, all pervading, all encompassing world, pervade the all encompassing world with the mind of goodwill. That no part of our experience is, is not included. I mean, it's, it's really just asking for all of our reactivity and all of our, those exceptions to be shown a light on. But I really appreciate that the Buddha talked in this way and, and in other ways that really demonstrated how uh, important he felt that this commitment to our own heart's purity, you could say, our own heart's um, clarity around the suffering of ill will and aversion and the protection of goodwill, protection, and also that it just, there's so many benefits, which the Buddha also went into, it sets in motion beautiful things. It's a source of happiness for ourselves and others, a source of trust and freedom from fear. The Buddha said when we practice metta, it gives freedom from fear to countless beings because beings don't have to fear us. We walk in a room without ill will and aversion and fear. We're not there to harm anyone and that's a gift. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll um, just share one more thing and open it up. But along these lines about the, the high standards, the high bar, there's this famous discourse, which probably some of you are familiar with, about the, uh, uh, the simile of the saw. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking about this, like, we can think of metta as being maybe, I don't know, we might think of it as as uh, kind of sentimental at times, or it's, oh, but this teaching really shows that it's, yeah, it's a, it's a high bar and it's, uh, 
it's not sentimental. So this teaching, basically the Buddha is saying, even if he's making a point here with using this extreme example, he says that even if bandits were to capture you and saw you limb by limb, you should still pervade them and spread and spreading from them the whole world with a mind of of goodwill and kindness um, that that's the teaching and and if 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 you were to give rise to aversion you would not be practicing my teaching i don't think what he's saying obviously is that violence is justified that these people are acting skillfully he's making the point that uh that it doesn't help <laughs> in that situation. It just causes our self suffering. And, um, and, you know, I mean, to think of it, you know, if we're going to die in a situation like that, you know, to die with a heart full of hate and a will, we can see that would be more suffering. And there's actually stories uh, of people in similar situations you know, where it's clear, oh yeah, this could be the end. How do I want to go out? And actually there's, I mean, I'll just tell you, there's a story of that, just that happened to Ajahn Suchita, who some of you may be familiar with. He was attacked um, while on pilgrimage in, in India and just kind of submitted, bowed his head because it was, you know, he was at their mercy and just that, that lack of fear and aversion was so, was so just kind of confusing, I imagine, and unsettling, not the, not the reaction you would expect if someone's captured you and take, taken all your stuff and it's about to kill you. But that was the understanding in his mind at that time, I imagine was, oh yeah, th this could be, this could be the end. Well, how does this mind want to go out? And that's the understanding. It's not about the other person and their behavior and justifying or not. It's this heart here and wanting to, to protect this heart. So obviously this is an extreme example and it's not the Buddha would, you know, I, it's not about judging, you know, ourselves. I think it's really, you know, it's a, it's a metaphor and it's an extreme example and what I take away from it is just this curiosity about um, yeah, just what I've been speaking about, kind of opening our minds to what you know what what would that look like to value to appreciate the value of this heart and this mind's capacity to pervade to pervade the world, to pervade situations, other people, ourselves, with goodwill, and um, to be free from aversion and ill will towards ourselves and towards others. And that this that it's really it's really relevant and it's really um, worthy of our of our efforts and it's so I mean it's so applicable to our daily lives and to and it's so again it's not about being perfect um, but it's about appreciating the happiness that can come from learning all these ordinary ways learning from the pain of aversion and ill will and and what arises from that when we act it out. And learning the nuances and and the applicability of coming to life to any situation, at least as a you know as a hypothesis, from a place of wishing for our well-being, wishing for our happiness, and wishing for others' happiness and well-being, and that as sort of a a guide for how we move about, and that maybe that. Maybe that actually is really um, a support of uh, support for our happiness and for that of others, and for making our own hearts and minds and our 
homes and our societies just a little bit more supportive. Like I was saying at the beginning, this being, this metta being, being a source of nourishment, <clears throat> of happiness, of safety, of ease. Some a place where the heart can rest, feel accepted. So I'll leave my comments there. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, I'll open it up and see if people have thoughts to share from your own experience. It's, it's always um, supportive for all of us just to hear people sharing directly from your own practice. What are you learning about um, this uh, this area about goodwill and aversion and you know in the messy places where it's not quite clear and you're you're figuring it out through trial and error what what actually um, makes sense, what's functional, what's supportive, um, or any questions you have from anything I've shared, but yeah, I'll just open it up, see who wants to share. <clears throat>